Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Don Brown Anderson of the School of Architecture, Planning, and Landscape, and it is an absolute thrill to see so many of you here tonight. Um, I want to start by acknowledging the land that we are privileged to live and work on. And I also want to, to make note of the fact that uh, as part of our truth and reconciliation process, <clears throat> we've established an Indigenous Pathways program for our new undergraduate bachelor's degree. And because we have so many successful alumni practitioners in the room, I'm going to, uh, to say that there is an opportunity and, and, uh, for for our professional partners to participate in our Pathways program through a scholarship um, opportunity where we provide a $5,000 scholarship for each of the six years that a student will take to go from their high school to a graduate degree in, the, in, in one of our professional programs, and that they are on our side, we will guarantee admission into the program of their choice if they maintain the credit. Uh, as we all know, we have an obligation, uh, and not only an obligation, but, but an absolute professional interest in increasing the number of Indigenous practitioners in all of our disciplines. And the way to do that is through uh, mentorship, <clears throat> through academic programming, but also through the financial support that's required in order to enable um, these individuals to, to join us in our profession. So, um, it's, a, it's part of our truth and reconciliation um, uh, commitment, and it's also uh, an opportunity for any of you that are interested to, uh, to participate. So as I, as I originally started saying, we want to contribute to the land of the traditional people of this, of this region that has stewarded the land for millennia. That includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising the Siksika, Akani and the Kana First Nations, as well as the Sutina First Nation and the Stony Dakota Nations, which includes Chiniki, Bearspot, and Goodstone Stony First Nations. And also, make note of the fact that Calgary is home to Métis Nation, now I can say region, or sorry, uh, it's a district five and six, rather than region three, as a result of the recent, uh, recent election that's going on. So we are here uh, to, to celebrate the career of one of the longest standing members of our school. Um, I was thinking about this on the way down, that I actually hired Graham, which is particularly freaky for me, because what am I doing here if Graham's retiring and I was there for him? He got a few more years left of me, and then, and then, you know, then, then we'll, we'll see. So, Graham joined us in 1991. A lot of you were born then. Uh, some of you were students then, with lots more hair, and, you know, all the rest. Um, and and it's just wonderful to see the turnout. I think this is probably the largest group that we've had attend uh, an event in this space in the six years that we've been here. And I think it's a testament to the impact that Graham has had on this school. So as I said, I was privileged uh, to, or you can hold me responsible, depends on how you feel about it. The fact that you're here, you'll think it's a privilege to hire Graham in 1991. And we have been colleagues for these 32, almost 33 years. And, um, We've had, a, I think, an interesting relationship. Graham has always been the sober second thought to my unbridled enthusiasm. And, uh, and, and I, at the time, sometimes that was extremely frustrating. But, in, but, in, but, but after the meetings were over or after the crit was done, you know, and I kind of settled down, I go, you know, Graham's actually right. Or at least I'd say that at least probably 60%. <laughs> and so I've always appreciated uh, working with Graham. I respect him deeply as an architect, as an educator, as an individual. He has unwavering moral compass that guides everything that he's done, which is sometimes some of the things that bother me, but come on, let's just make this happen. Um, and and I, it's been a privilege to have him at our school. And, and I know I'm going to miss him. 
And from the turnout that we see here, um, I think a lot of people feel, feel the same way. So it is a kind of end, end of an era. Now, at this point, I should just directly introduce Graham, but I'm not going to do that because there's something else that I have to do, which is, um, is to introduce a group of students here who are members of the Ultra 8 editorial group. Some of you, have, and we've been doing this now long enough that there are alumni that are in the, in the, in the room, I'm sure, who remember the Ultra 8 or the Ultra experience. This is Ultra 8, so it's the eighth year that we've been doing it. And um, you know, it is a student-led uh, publication. Uh, we help fund or we underwrite the purchase of some of the books, but it is completely um, managed uh, editorially and logistically by the students. They put an incredible amount of work into this and the quality of the publication each year uh, is wonderful. And I think each year it gets just that much better. So um, I'm going to pass it along. I originally had two names that I was to read, but one of them did show up, and then we found a pen, and I was going to write it out, and they said, no, just call us the, the Ultra 8 group. So um, that's what I'm going to do. So I'll now pass you over to the Ultra 8 group, who will tell you about the upcoming publication of Ultra Number 8. Thank you, Graham. Hello, everyone. I'm Natasha, and this is Carmen, Roslyn, Edie, and B. And we would like to briefly introduce you to the Ultra Journal, which is the student-led journal here at Sapple that is meant to showcase the work that students at the school produce throughout the year. This is an excellent way to have projects that you've worked on in studio or in other classes published. Historically, Ultra has been mainly composed of projects from students in the architecture program. But last year, Ultra 7 made a concerted effort to diversify projects and include works from all three programs, as well as submissions from the ME, DES students and PhD candidates. Ultra 8 would like to continue this initiative to ensure this journal showcases the diversity of programs and students at Sapple. We will also be creating space in the book for the new undergraduate students to showcase their work as well. So this year, the Ultra 8 team is led by seven women from architecture, planning, and landscape architecture. And our goal is to curate your submissions and create a book that we hope reflects uh, your experience at Sapple. And we would highly encourage you to submit your work to this year's journal. Um, we would also like you to consider um, submitting work like your blog week coursework or process work that you, that you created throughout your studio um, and other courses. Um, even if you think that it's unfinished or you might think that it's unfined, um, we think that it's integral to show this work um, in a published format um, in our journal this year. In addition to process work, we would encourage you to submit work produced through a variety of, 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 of mediums, including but not limited to essays, drawings, renderings, and diagrams. We will be opening Sub, sub submissions earlier this year in comparison to, to last year, just, just to give you more time to get your work into us. Submissions will be open, will open at the end of, of this semester, leaving you the winter break to think about what you would like to submit to the journal. Thank you, and we look forward to receiving your work. Now, now we will pass it over to Jason Johnson. Welcome, everybody. Um, welcome tonight and next week, <clears throat> when we'll have another faculty member retired so that we can get all of you back in the building. That's for one The doors have been locked. All right. Um, so if, if you're in this room, uh, there's a pretty good chance uh, that you not only know Graham, but have a pretty good uh, impersonation of him that you <laughs> pull out at parties or dinners. Uh, I went around and 
looked for the best one earlier. Uh, but we'll, we'll save those maybe for the social media feed after. Um, so I, I'd like to agree with uh, a lot of what uh, John has said here tonight. One of the things um, I won't talk about this sort of bio that's on here because we've all got an invitation and I'm sure uh, his career is, in, is the topic of, of the talk. Uh, but I did want to second the uh, sort of notion that Graham is a very conscientious colleague and somebody who makes sure that when we're doing something, uh, we think of all sides of the problem, even if he's presenting them in opposition to each other uh, and sort of in a debate with himself as we <laughs> wait to see which side he will take on the uh, issue and then decide if we want to start the whole, the whole thing over again. Um, you know, I, I, I know that um, we, uh, as a school, will, will miss Graham's uh, attention to detail and, and really uh, making sure that events like this uh, are still part of us, part of our culture and the design culture of the school. And I really appreciate all of you who've come out, and I hope that in future events he'll come out as well. We won't be able to see Graham as he's going on a terminal sabbatical after the semester, which sounds worse than it is. Um, Kier S, I don't know which Kier I won't specify, uh, thought maybe uh, we were putting him in one of his beloved canoes and floating him down the river. <laughs> but I, I don't think we mean terminal in that one. So um, I want to thank all of you for coming out. And please join me in welcoming Graham. Thanks for coming out. Um, you know, being a, a university professor uh, is a real privilege. My father was a professor, and it, it wasn't sort of my initial goal in life, but I, I guess I got into it quite young. And I can thank John for, for taking me on at a, at a very early age. Um, and it, it seems like the years have been low by. It's, it's staggering to think that you know, we're talking over 30 years. Um, but, it, you know, it's uh, teaching people and, and seeing what they do when they leave uh, this place is, uh, is amazing. It's a bit like being a parent. And I think we're all, you know, so proud of, of what each of you accomplish when you leave. And that's, it's a, it ends up being a testimony to you know, what we're doing. But being a university professor also gives you a tremendous scope and freedom to you know, experiment with you. As I was saying to my students today, you know, you're, you're, you're sort of human guinea pigs off. <laughs> Hopefully it doesn't have you know, long-term impact. I think it's not in a negative way. Um, I was talking about this lecture as being sort of fluff and nuggets. I don't know where that came from. It had to do with something with you know chicken McNuggets and, and, and trying to keep this sort of light and not too serious. But I I did want to talk a little bit about my career. I'm, hopefully it's not too tedious. There are a lot of pictures. Um, but I, you know, I started architecture school you know quite a long time ago not as long as some people in this room but quite a long time ago and uh, at that time i you know certainly a guy called aldo rossi was, was quite important and you know, he probably should be more important today than he is but we we really had it ingrained into us this connection between architecture and the city and i and i think that's something that's certainly driven my my career. So I'm going to try to show a few aspects of my work. 
And I was thinking, this is kind of a, it feels like a report on what I've been doing. <laughs> 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 um, so I think in a way, I'm the only person who knows about it. That's sort of the peculiarity of maybe operating in Canada. But it also, you know, coming here, um, and I came to Mon from, here, from Montreal in 1991, since, you know, John divulged the year, I guess. <laughs> uh, you know, we came in a little car and drove across the country and had no idea what we were getting into. And it's been fabulous. I mean, I, I, even though I, I now love, uh, live in Ontario, I, you know, I, I, I love Alberta, I love the landscape, love the people, and um, it's, it will always be a huge part of my life. <clears throat> So the, the first phase of my career when I got here, I mean, was, you know, I think in a way we're, of course, shaped by the time that we're in. And so I've, I've been able to write, I've been able to teach. Um, fortunately, I was able to have a practice for a while. Um, but in the early years, and this comes out of school when I was a student, and, and you know, it also, you know, an event like this allows me to reflect on, you know, the changing world of architecture, the changing world of architectural education, the changing world of um, technology, the impact of technology. So, influenced by work I did at graduate school, you know, what I, what we could call narrative theory, I've been sort of bamboozling a group of students this week with some of this stuff. But it, it, this really influenced the um, first decade or so that I was here. Um, and I, I don't, I, I put in a few quotes, but I don't really expect you to read them. Um, but merely to say that, that at this point in time, I was interested in, in the city from a, from a particular angle, and that had to do with uh, things like stories, uh, sort of linguistic and literary aspects of the city, um, and, and also sort of the structural aspects of the city. Um, and that's reflected in, I guess, the first real book that I published in 2004, this book, Passages, which is a kind of obscure little collection of essays. <laughs> Noel has a copy. <laughs> um, which you know allowed me to kind of sum up what I had been thinking about to that point in my career. Um, and and again, trying to think about the city from sort of different dimensions. Um, And, and it, it, it weirdly ties into a, a, you know a very is this working uh, a, a kind of recent collaboration with uh, Jesse and Phil, um, part of a, a a kind of interesting project that I got involved in um, a few years ago called the Calgary Atlas Project um, with the Calgary Institute for the Humanities. Actually, I can claim that this was my idea. So. <laughs> you know how you have ideas and you think they're great ideas and you run around like a crazy person trying to convince other people that your idea is a good idea and most people just... <laughs> These guys actually took this idea seriously and now we have you know, 10 or 12 maps that capture different aspects of Calgary's history, sort of unique aspects of Calgary's history. And each map involves a researcher and, a, and an artist. And so Spectacle designed the map, and I sort of identified some buildings in Calgary that uh, I felt sort of traced the architectural history of, of this city in a, in a kind of pre-colonial time. Um, One of my intentions, and I, I don't know if, and it's something I've been very lucky to be able, to, what was lucky to do was to actually use academia to go into practice. So um, it was a kind of intention, and it, it really occurred because I met David Dow. And, uh, 
for those of you who have encountered David, I mean, he's a, a wonderful and, and very thoughtful person. I was very lucky uh, to encounter David, you know, fairly soon after I came here. I think it was through the, the lecture series that ran at that time. And so we embarked on a relatively short career as a firm, only nine years. I mean, I guess most firms just don't stop one day, but uh, there's a whole set of reasons, I guess, why we decided to wrap it up. But, but while we were doing it, um, you know, we had, we had some fun, I think, and I know a couple of former employees are here. Saw Ulrich earlier. Is Ulrich in the house? There he is. How's it going? <laughs> Good to see you. Um, so it was a great time to sort of experiment. And I think, as I was saying to the students today, I think it's important that you try to determine what you're doing as a practice, what you're trying to capture, what you're focused on. And I think after a while, this this was our attempt to try to, or at least my attempt to try to formulate what we were doing, which in a part, in part came out of a certain reality that we were in, right? How do you make architecture without a lot of money, basically? And so that became a reality and we, we practiced for about nine years and executed houses, which, which tended to be more David's forte, but you know, we, we certainly worked together on them. Um, various kinds of houses. You know, and the interesting thing about architectural practice for all of you, of you that are in, involved in architectural practice, it's sort of like a soap opera. Like every project is like a soap opera with, you know, a cast of characters and, you know, most projects go well, but you know, <laughs> there are those projects that go completely sideways and strange things happen. Um, but you know, that, that adds to the, the sort of overall narrative, I suppose. And um, we tried various things in various places. We did this house um, in the, in the, up on the side of a mountain in the Crow's Nest Pass a couple of years after the firm wrapped up and it was one of the most, um, I have to say one of the most remarkable sites in, probably in the country. Um, and, and it certainly has been a privilege to, to live in the sort of Alberta, southern Alberta landscape. It's, it's something I definitely miss, um, you know, living in east again. But we had, you know, other kinds of projects. We tried various things and, uh, and again, I think there was a lot of rewarding experiences like teaching, practicing, you know, ultimately is is, 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 is a kind of collaboration. Um, and so I'm just sort of giving a, a kind of overview of, of some of the work that we worked on. And we, you know, we kind of weirdly managed to get into some cultural sector work, uh, often again under very tricky circumstances with no money. Um, this project we did at ACAD, there was a question about whether we were actually going to be able to paint the drywall. We were so tight with budget. Um, and a very rewarding project with the Art Gallery of Calgary um, that, you know, like all projects, has its own peculiar story. Um, very interesting client. With, with a really incredible vision of what a contemporary art gallery could be. Um, but, you know, money, of course, was always an issue, but it ended up meaning that we, a previous architect had done some work on the building and then we came back in and ripped chunks out of the building and sort of reorganized things in a way that, you know, many clients would have just completely balked at. But, uh, we were able to convince them that they needed to be fairly aggressive with the project. 
<clears throat> I don't know what it's being used for now. Is it vacant, abandoned? Is it now uh, something else? Anybody know what the old art gallery of Calgary is? Oh well. <laughs> and other projects that we worked on, you know, later in the in the in the history of the firm. Um, this project for Vulcan County was uh, really interesting. Our clients were a group of ranchers who ran the county and. You know, in some ways they were a fabulous client because they basically said, you know, well, you're the architect, you should know what you're doing, just do it. <laughs> it was exceptionally refreshing. I remember we took, you know, a sample do board down one day to Vulcan and they just sort of looked at it. That looks great. That just looks great. Get on. <laughs> but, you know, they were, you know, it was very... Um, Satisfying. This was an addition to uh, an existing building. So, I've been reflecting on, on certain things in my life. You know, I, I, I guess it's sort of well known I like Le Corbusier, and I um, there's always this question of why would somebody like somebody who's so well known and so popular? But I also like Led Zeppelin. And uh, <laughs> it, my first encounter with Led Zeppelin was, you know, a life-altering experience, right? And so um, one has to acknowledge those. But then people, you know, also would say the same, same thing about Led Zeppelin. It's, uh, why would you like the biggest band in the world? It's so, like, passe, right? And, and I have a hard time defending Led Zeppelin. But when I encountered Led Zeppelin, I was living in Fredericton, New Brunswick, and, which is a fairly small city. I went to high school and junior high school there. And, uh, I, and I went to the biggest high school in the British Commonwealth, biggest high school in Canada, it used to be. And I couldn't really find any other Led Zeppelin fans. This is maybe one or two others. Um, but the same sort of thing happened to me probably around 2005 when I first sort of really encountered Deleuze and Guattari. And so I made a kind of change in direction um, from the kind of work that I'd been exposed to at graduate school. And so this has shaped a lot of my writing and work since then. Um, this. Uh, strange encounter, um, and has led me into <clears throat> sort of other ways of thinking about architecture, um, what, what is the, the function of architecture. We, you know, we were talking a lot about this idea this week, you know, when, and we, you know, I think the students, we were looking at some of the buildings on campus trying to understand how, do the, how are the spaces occupied, are they occupied? the way the designer intended them or not. Um, and this has, you know, led me to um, a number of projects and, and also led me to my doctoral work um, that I did fairly late in life. So after I abandoned the practice, I decided that doing a doctorate would be interesting. And also, teaching myself basically about ecology. So my thinking about the city had moved from um, narrative and, and, and notions like that towards thinking about the structure of urban environments in sort of more unusual ways. Uh, and again, mo mainly in writings um, and, and, and in the way certain classes were um, organized, studios were organized. And with a group of colleagues, I think uh, I saw Fabian earlier, um, we tried to turn some of this into a diagram. Mary Ellen was involved in this strange exercise <laughs> where we tried to take some of the thinking that was, was coming out of the studio and, and work on 
this as a kind of a theory. It's still very undeveloped. So one reason, if not maybe the main reason John hired me was that I could teach studio and history. And you know, so I was sort of, I guess, cost effective. <laughs> uh, but I had that, you know, I was very fortunate at McGill to study with two of the world's greatest architectural historians. And, you know, and it was, you know, both of them have been very impactful on me. Um, but I don't really consider myself a historian. You know, Dave's a hot historian. I'm, I'm not really a historian. I sort of dabble in history. But, right. but, but teaching studio, uh, and, and, and of course, I always enjoy teaching history and teaching theory. Um, but, you know, teaching studio is a whole different animal. And again, over the last 30 years, of, of course, techniques and methods have changed, subjects have changed, you know, the, the kind of preoccupations within business, within academia have changed. But, you know, I've been very lucky to teach practically every kind of studio there is. Uh, including, you know, a number of, I think, quite interesting urban design studios um, that, you know, tackled various things. This, the, the, the image on the right was a studio we ran a couple of years in Portland, Oregon, uh, with uh, groups of sort of interdisciplinary teams. I did try on various occasions to try to get interdisciplinary design teams to work. Um, And over time, I mean, studio teachers, I think, build upon what they've been taught, but then over time will, you know, evolve their own preoccupations, their own methods. So, you know, I think it's important that you're, you know, certainly students in the program are exposed to different approaches, different preoccupations. In recent years, I've become particularly interested in, in, in analysis and the, the notion that students ground their work in certain kinds of analysis and, and trying to push analytical drawing. So that's been sort of pre a preoccupation of lo a lot of my recent studios. I've always been really interested in, in doing a making exercise, and this really goes back into the 90s, that, that some, at some point in the studio, that the, studio, that the students work you know, in a one-to-one you know, -one exercise and, and work with actual materials. So we, over the years, I've done a lot of projects with plywood, uh, and then projects with cardboard and paper, occasionally with metal, things like that, but it, I found students always responded extremely well to these kinds of projects uh, and, and enjoyed the, the kind of change of scale and the challenge of, you know, working with actual materials. And, you know, the, the assignments were, you know, often tied to, obviously, the, the kind of theme of the studio. Last year, um, and, and a couple of students, I think, are in the, the room, we did, a, a, I thought, a really fun exercise to, to design wearable shelter. And, and I think the students had a week to take a drop cloth, a Home Depot drop cloth, which, which turned out to be rather dull material, I think, and to create a, an article of clothing that you could actually um, sleep in. Uh, <clears throat> seemed to sort of, to, I think, help the studio along. And one year, um, it may have been the last time I did a senior studio, or a, a kind of option studio. I, I think I got sent into the trenches at one point, and, <laughs> and that was it. I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm not bitter or anything. But, um, 
But it was a really fun studio, and the students had to design and build a prototypical refugee shelter and, uh, um, uh, out of fabric. And so these are this is you know sort of early work, but this project actually uh, won a prize. It was for a competition, uh, or it was a, for a, a, a competition to use a particular kind of fabric. Um, but you know that was a really uh, enjoyable kind of exercise. Um, and recently, you know, I worked in Studio Two, um, working on housing. You know, sort of introducing students to housing, um, which again has um, been, I think. A really interesting studio given my sort of continuing interest in the city and I'm, I certainly I you know I, I'm certainly hoping that the, the program continues this strong urban commitment I know it's embedded in the name of the new degree so um, it, it to me and you know I guess coming from the era that I come from um, and, and given the, the, the problem of the global city I think it's you know, it's, it's, if it's not the major challenge we face, it's certainly one of the major challenges we face. And so I think understanding the city in its many complicated dimensions is, is, is really vital. Um, but it's also, you know, I think, you know, as we know, the studio is such a powerful learning environment and it's always amazing to see what students produce it's uh, in a way and i'm sure many of my colleagues do it the same way you you establish a kind of a kind of framework and then you sort of see what comes out the end and you, in my case I'm, I, I i don't try to predetermine the end result and it's it's always in, inspiring to see what comes out at the end of term and, and what students you know will sort of commit to These are, you know, examples of, you know, the early days when I was here, when students were still drawing by hand. Um, it was a very, very different time. Um, but uh, even though I was trained in this era, I've always been a, 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 a certainly an advocate for digital, even if I can't claim to be digital dude or whatever you might call it. <laughs> um, so this is these two drawings which were you know from the 90s and and by you know two really great students um, uh, you know, are just sort of capturing a, a kind of period that seems um, both near and far and in the in the old days we you know we used to have Kind of thesis project. So you you know you had it as a as a teacher you had to you got to work with a student for a couple of semesters on a project and 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 forge quite a close relationship with them. So um, again, a lot of interesting work. It's interesting that David Fortin, you know, one of our graduates, who's now a professor at Waterloo, very and you know one of the leading voices for indigenous design. His thesis was a, a, a hotel on the moon based on Le Corbusier's monastery at La Tourette. Totally digital. Um, there wasn't one iota of indigenous content in it. But the question was, how do you, what spaces do you create in, you know, in that kind of gravity condition? Right? It was an interesting project in kind of manipulating form. But, you know, I mean, clearly drawing techniques change. <clears throat> and recently, and, you know, in a couple of recent studios, I've been, you know, 
and, and in conjunction with you know my colleagues you know running the studios we've been looking at problems like the tall building in in, in Calgary and how can one turn the tall structure into a, a really a different kind of functioning form. So See a number of examples from like my students from, from very weak school days. I think Sabah's in the room. Project here. I see Ethan's here. So again, the students, I think, really responded to this kind of challenge you know, to, to, to think about this, this kind of typology in, in new ways and, and to program this typology uh, in, in very unusual ways. So it's, it, again, very inspiring. So this work, um, this in fact, this book on the right is really based on my doctorate. Um, and, and where I sort of verged into trying to mash up Deleuze and Guattari, ecological theory, and the Garden City. I'm, I'm not sure it was a successful mashup, but um, I learned a lot doing it. Um, and it, I think, continued to augment and, and transform my thinking about the city as, as a kind of problem. When did we start? Am I going long? I need to speed this up. And embedded in all of this was the idea of the gardener, and uh, that you know led me into some interest in literature review. Uh, and, and you know, and sort of really examining the, the kind of early history of of, of what has been a both very influential and very controversial idea about urban settlement. One of the things about being an academic is it allows you to operate at different scales. And, and, you know, and, and coming to Alberta um, and the prairies you know, allowed me to become invested in this part of Canada um, and, and certainly invested in the city in different ways, invested in the country, and you know, and then I had various opportunities to, you know, be involved internationally in different organizations during my career. Um, so some very early projects, you know, so looking at Canadian modern architecture and promoting it. Uh, has also been something that I've had the opportunity to do. Book on Gordon Atkins, you know, was quite satisfying. I, interestingly enough, yesterday had the opportunity to visit one of his uh, buildings, uh, one of his condominium and one of his housing projects up in the Northwest. And, and to meet somebody who bought this unit and is essentially restoring it to its original. Somebody who's prepared to live in an environment that's entirely floored in quarry tile. Most of you may not even know what quarry tile is, but it's a very popular material. It was a very popular material in the 1970s. And at the time, it was very rewarding to, you know, to meet Gordon and to, you know, to look at his work. But a few years ago, <clears throat> Um, you know, and like many things in life that are sort of fortuitous, I had an opportunity to meet uh, the editor of Canadian Architect Magazine, and it was coming up to the 60th anniversary of Canadian Architect Magazine, so I kind of pitched the idea to her that, you know, we do a book on 60 years of Canadian Architect Magazine. That morphed into this book that was published in 2019, Canadian um, Modern Architecture, 1967 to the present. So it really captures the period from <clears throat> Canada's centennial to 
really 2017. And it was an exceptionally rewarding project. Working with Elsa Lam, uh, the co-editor of the project, was really a, a remarkable experience. Um, and then we worked with uh, six, uh, 15 other authors and you know, multiple other collaborators in trying to put together a book that captured the regional dimensions of Canadian architecture and various sort of thematic ideas, looking at work with indigenous communities, looking at work, um, you know, the, the, the Canadians have undertaken in, in sustainable and green architecture. And, oh, and I, I'm proud of this book. Um, we were very lucky that Princeton Architectural Press took it on and, and they put an enormous amount of work into it. it. It does remind me that as Canadians, we need to be proud of our, prouder of our culture and more that we have to be really committed to what we do in this country in, in the, you know, the cultural industries and architecture and design are are, you know, are part of that. In my own, you know, contributions to the book, um, of course, I focused on the prairies um, and ended up sort of boiling it down to what, I, what, what, I, what felt to me sort of four periods in the evolution of prairie architecture since since the 1960s. The first really shaped by three important figures, sort of one per province, you know, sort of an equal distribution. Um, of course, Etienne Gabary in uh, Manitoba, Clifford Means in Saskatchewan. We have Trevor here, who of course has worked on, on at least two of these figures. And, and, and then of course, Cardinal from Alberta. And in a strange way, uh, in all three of their work, in the work of all three architects, of, of course, there's this incredible engagement with landscape. Uh, from what I, I, I'm quite good, from what I understand, Etienne Gabary is Métis, right? And this is, I, I think it's, it's a kind of more recent understanding about his heritage. But all three of these architects sort of experimented with and, and, and sort of understood, I think, a, a kind of indigenous engagement with the landscape. And we're, we're talking about in the 1960s, so some of what we're attempting today, you know, may not be quite as new as, as, as we might think. And by the 70s, architects were really, you know, kind of digging in, right? Digging in was the way to go. So um, this idea of sheltering form, which um, is, it, you know, I thought was sort of inspired by Gordon Atkins' work, uh, seemed to really preoccupy all kinds of architects in this era. And it's not like it was only occurring in the prairies, but it, it, it had a particular resonance here, and I think it, it, there, were, there were architects who did this with particular accomplishment. And then, you know, as, as one would expect by the 1980s, uh, you know, postmodernism had, had really taken hold, although you know, it had started 20 years before in the, in the U.S., or at least this kind of postmodernism. But it, but likewise, and particularly in Alberta, we find a number of architects, uh, I think, you know, uh, very adept at interpreting certain kinds of local and historic and colonial, mainly colonial forms in their work maybe a slightly paradoxical shift in history when you think about it, but, uh, you know, an, an architect like Fred Valentine, who 
was trained as an Orthodox modernist, so convincingly transformed himself into a, a kind of critical regionalist. And then, you know, another shift reflected in, you know, in the work, I think, of many of the younger practices in, particularly in Calgary and Winnipeg, uh, that, I, that I think embraces a, a, a more of a, a kind of rejuvenated modernism. So, and I think work that, you know, very recent work that has been quite experimental. And quite provocative. So writing has, you know, been a part, an important part of what I've been trying to do, um, along with teaching. I, you know, I also had the privilege to, to be involved in administration for, for nine years. Running the school was interesting and. In the early 2000s, you know, in partnership with Brian Sinclair, we really made a concerted effort to, to enlarge the architecture program. And, and I think that's reflected by the fact that, you know, we, we've been graduating larger classes, which means that, you know, our graduates are really, you know, having broader and broader impact. And now we're going through this massive, you know, increase in student population with the new undergraduate program, which, you know, in a way I, I feel unfortunate. I feel somewhat sad that I won't be here to, to be involved in it, but I'm confident it's gonna take off like a rocket. Uh, you know, I've also had the opportunity to work with various journals and I did a kind of weird project on Le Corbusier just to satisfy that, you know, love of big figures, I guess. Um, and, and, you know, as Trevor would say, and Trevor, of course, is a very distinguished graduate of our program and one of the great architectural journalists and writers in Canada. Right, Trevor? <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean that in a, I'm, I'm deadly serious. He's, your book on um, a collection of your writings is coming out with Dalhousie Press. Or, but, you know, writing, I find writing about buildings in, a, in the context of journalism quite difficult, especially when you can't be really particularly negative. So, I mean, that's a dimension that's really changed if you, you know, what. One point, I looked through the entire back set of Canadian Architect magazine, and when you read the way building reviews were undertaken in the 70s, it's completely different than it is today. But my my approach was try to find, you know, as I guess any writer would do, to, to find an angle in each review, an angle that seemed somehow meaningful and worth, you know, uh, bringing forward. And, you know, I, I don't like the word retirement. I feel like it's just another phase where I'm shifting the balance in what I do. And again, I've been exceptionally privileged to be, have been able to work here for so many years to have my career here. Um, I'm sort of embarking on thinking about domesticity, and I'm just finishing up a book for Rutledge on the history of modern architecture. I decided, you know, Canada wasn't big enough, might as well just go for the whole thing. <laughs> so we'll see what happens with that. It's, a, it's, it's kind of a primer. It's, uh, with the, the word count that I was given by the publisher, I probably should have used a totally different structure than what I'm using, but I decided to be kind of pig-headed. Guess we'll find out what, how it goes over next year or so. 
Um, and I thought I would just end with, you know, root picture of happy students and <laughs> happy teachers, and happy uh, elders, a number of elders who, you know, helped us with this studio that Baby and, and Hal Eagle Tail and I ran a couple of years ago, and which was, you know, I think a, a very interesting experiment and built upon many earlier themes um, in my teaching. So, you know, I didn't want to make this too long or too onerous, so that's what I have to say today. I'll, I'll tell you, yeah, twice. Um, now that you've asked, it's cost effective. Cost effective because, you know, when you hire somebody really young, it's not as expensive. And then after 30 years and they retire, you get the salary back and you can hire two young people. So, yeah. <laughs> But it was an excellent, an excellent investment, an excellent investment. Anything else? another song like the Beatles or <laughs> um, You know, I, I, I was very fortunate to be very young when I decided I wanted to be an architect. Like I was in junior high school and I just pursued it like straight down the line. You know, you don't really know how your life's going to unfold. There's going to be many moments where you make decisions or things occur that are either good decisions or things that are out of your control. That, uh, but I, I don't really have any regrets in that sense. I don't know what I would change. I was a pretty cocky kid at 20. <laughs> I was probably a bit of a pain in the ass at school. But, uh, <laughs> Any other questions, comments? I just, I just wanna say, I, I only see, you know, Grandma I'm only gonna see you every couple of years, but it's like a, a check-in with the doctor, I feel like. <laughs> we connect, it's like, what are you up to? And I tell you and you're like, that's a good decision. And so I always, I've always used sort of a, a, a litmus test in my own life. So, so thank you for guiding me. Well, and, you know, I, and I appreciate that. I, I mean, I, and I think I would speak for all, you know, teachers, and not to speak for all teachers, but I think, it, as I said, it's, it's really rewarding to work with, to be a teacher. And, and, and you know, and I've, I still find it really remarkable and exciting to talk to somebody who's putting together a portfolio and applying to the program and, and trying to advise them. And, and you know, advising is certainly part of the job and I've doled out a lot of advice, I, you know, a lot of career advice. I hope it's been useful. <laughs> some people took it, some people didn't. How's the housing case in? Is it fabulous? <laughs> yeah, it's pretty great. Yeah. <laughs> pretty nice. Sure. All right. Okay, so um, so 
in honor of, of this auspicious occasion, we took the extraordinary, whoa, extraordinary <laughs> step of, it's like turning the lights on after a stairway to heaven in the basement. Right? <laughs> Some of you will understand what that means. Not everyone, obviously. Anyways, because of this auspicious occasion, and you know the University of Calgary and liquor rules and all of the craziness of that, we went to the extraordinary steps of having a Prosecco toast uh, to follow the, the, the lecture. Of course, only like a third of you actually registered <laughs> for the event. There were like two thirds of you just walked in, which we are really happy about. <laughs> but there's been a bit of a frantic kind of thing going on back here where we do have some very nice glasses with some very nice Prosecco, and then we have some plastic glasses with some Prosecco, and then we've got some plastic glasses with some white wine, and we've got some plastic glasses with some red wine, and I just saw that there's a few back there with beer. <laughs> so we're not gonna get into sort of biblical references here, but it, 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 I think it's a fitting testament you always know you're in a good party when you run out of the booze and, uh, and when the room's full. So, so I, 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 I ask you all, and if you're really interested in the good glass, you can fight your way over there and get there first. But there, is, there should be enough for everybody. And when you all have your glass, we will raise a toast to Graham's career. So thank you, Graham. Thank you.